It's easy to save the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Just add a third Southern Slavic crown and there you go. Of course, this would just be the first step in a further and broader federalization of the empire where eventually every nationality, or at least most of them, get their own crowns. This would, hopefully, prevent the nationalities from seeking unification with outside powers, independence from the imperial project or other self-destructive plans. Under this model, it is often considered, Austria-Hungary might even thrive into the modern day. As you might have seen from the title, I disagree with this notion. Today I will argue that while such reforms are not impossible, they are far more difficult to implement than often portrayed, and just getting a pro-reform emperor is not enough to make it happen. Besides that, I will also argue that such reforms far from solve the empire's issues, and do not guarantee the stability nor survival of said empire. Most of the issues I will discuss are caused by the Austro-Hungarian Compromise of 1867, and the way that the new state operated. While we're not going to discuss it today, an Austrian Empire that attempts to reform before this point has a far greater degree of success. But, as we will soon see, the way Hungary gained autonomy within the Empire pretty much doomed most realistic and successful routes to reform. Three main points will be discussed today. First, getting the support of the ruling nationalities. Second, the conflict between these nationalities within and without the empire. And finally, the risks posed by the crown system weakening central government. I hope that after this video, you will at least agree that more nuance might be needed in discussing Austro-Hungarian reform. But really quick before we start the video, here is a message from today's sponsor. You might be familiar with sprawling family trees of huge noble houses, or people drawing their ancestry back all the way to big figures like Genghis Khan. And you may have thought, but that isn't for me. My family is too ordinary and I wouldn't be able to find anything. Well, I'm here to say that this is not the case. With my heritage, it has become easier than ever to rebuild your own family tree. All you need to do is fill in your own, your parents' and your grandparents' names and the platform will automatically search all sorts of global databases for information about your family. As for myself, my grandfather recently passed away. He had a French last name, so I wanted to find out who was the first person in my family to leave France for the Netherlands. Through the Smart Match feature, I would work back generation after generation before finding Noël Dupré including an image of him who left France during their wars of revolution, bringing my family to Holland. They also find all sorts of information about your ancestors. Like here is an image of one of my ancestors found in the database. I can even enhance, colorize and animate the image through my heritage's features. Information like occupations and marriages, it's all there to be discovered. With the data gathered, you can even use AI to create a biography of any of your ancestors, where they summarize their life, birth, relations and occupation, and even add in historical context. So don't wait any longer and go explore your own family tree through the link in the description, where you will get a 14-day free trial of MyHeritage to find out your heritage. Now real quick before we dive in, don't take this to mean that I don't think multiculturalism works. It absolutely can work, as America is a good example of, and even in the modern day, Europe is also slowly proving. But both of these are very different to Austria-Hungary. In both of the examples I just gave, whatever group you feel you belong to, you can also be an American. Within Europe, whether you are a Pole, a Frenchman or a Bulgarian, you can also be a European. As we will soon discuss in detail, this is the exact opposite to how the crown system proposal seeks to solve ethnic conflict in Austria-Hungary. There would be little binding the member states together beyond loyalty to the crown and historical precedent. The Austrian Federation proposals we are discussing today seek to underpin the differences and segregate each nationality into their own little box. At least within this context, I think that this is unlikely to result in a long-term stable and peaceful solution. 
With that said, let's dive in by first explaining how the Austro-Hungarian Empire worked. For a full swift recap, I recommend this video by Look Back History, a quite underrated content creator, link in the description. But let me quickly recap the main points necessary for this video. Many like to imagine Austria-Hungary as a state like any other, but with the Hungarians having some autonomy. I myself am very guilty of this as well, as in nearly every single video within this time period, I will refer to the empire as Austria rather than Austria-Hungary, just because it is so much effort to pronounce the full name. But this is a misrepresentation of the truth. In the Compromise of 1867, Hungary did not just get autonomy for Austria, they practically got their independence. There was almost nothing tying the nations together besides the Emperor King, foreign policy, and the United Imperial Army. Aside from those aspects, Hungary and Austria governed themselves near completely separately, becoming equal states in the dual monarchy. To really underpin the degree of autonomy between the states, while a customs union did exist, there was a border running between the states, and there were several tariffs and restrictions in trade goods over these internal borders. You were also either a Hungarian or an Austrian citizen. You could not be both. Both nations had separate passports, and there was no such thing as being an Austro-Hungarian. There was also a secret third territory within the empire, Bosnia. Unofficially acquired by the Habsburgs in 1879, it didn't belong to Austria nor Hungary. Instead, it was co-ruled by both powers, first informally, until officially annexed in 1908. So, how did the two halves of the empire actually work? Obviously, this had changed a lot over time, but let's be broad here. First, the Austrian half. It had an upper house, which was dominated by the nobles, the clergy, and appointees by the emperor. The lower house was initially made up of representatives from the 17 regions within the Austrian Empire, with four classes represented, landowners, capitalists, cities, and rural areas. This remained the case until 1907, when the system was changed. From then onwards, universal male suffrage was enacted in Austria. But you shouldn't necessarily think that Austria had become some perfect democracy. The emperor remained a looming influence over Austrian politics. He had the power to appoint and dismiss cabinets and prime ministers, meaning any coalition in the lower house had to have the emperor's blessing. And, as mentioned, the emperor had significant influence over the upper house too. Across his reign, Franz Joseph's influence was crucial, as even within the Austrian portion of the empire, Germans only made up about a third of the population. This caused a plethora of issues. The rights of the minorities was an important one, but arguably so was the future of the German people. There were plenty of calls within the empire from German nationalists for integration or at least closer relations to Germany, or, if that was not possible, at least cement German dominance over their part of the empire. This conflict was greatly intensified by the fact that the 33% Germans were completely overshadowed by the 65% Slavic population of their half of the empire. This was the fundamental conflict that the emperor worried about during most of his reign. He was not a nationalist, and was not personally concerned with the ethnics of the empire, as long as the power of his monarchy was retained. For this reason, he often found himself a supporter of the minorities, like when he implemented universal male suffrage a reform very much benefiting the minorities. French Joseph didn't necessarily do this out of ideological reasons, it was to minimize the destructive tendencies of the Germans within the empire. Now the Hungarian half was completely different. Hungary, on paper, had a rather democratic parliament for the time. They had two parties dominating politics, the Liberal Party and the Party of Independence and 48. For most of Hungary's history, the Liberals would be the ones in government, and the Party of 48 the opposition. The most important difference is that the Liberals supported the Austro-Hungarian Compromise, while the Party of Independence, surprisingly, generally sought even more independence. 
During elections, you would generally see votes split among ethnic lines, with the minorities voting for the Liberal Party and most Hungarians voting for the Party of 48. But don't let this fool you. There was one thing that unified both parties. Hungarian supremacy. The minorities might vote for the Liberal Party, but the party itself was still dominated by Hungarians. Both parties agreed on the need to maintain Hungary's territorial integrity and the right of the Hungarians to dominate it. It was just that the Liberals were, relatively speaking, more pro-minority and the minorities generally saw the king and Hungary's ties to Austria as a moderating influence on the more radical Hungarian tendencies. Despite enjoying the minority vote, the Liberals were still big on the concept of Magyarization, a weakening of minority identities within their kingdom to maintain the Hungarian monopoly on power. Now with that preamble done, we can get into part one of the video, getting support from the parties necessary to reform the empire. Let's start with the most common first step in reforming the empire, the third crown idea. In this concept, the Croatians would essentially be presented a similar deal as the Hungarians, thereby becoming the third crown within the empire, often expanded with Dalmatia, Bosnia, and sometimes even Slovenia, and in real radical cases, the Istrian coastline. Were Austria-Hungary to expand further, Serbia and Montenegro are also often integrated. Now the potential upsides to creating this crown should be clear. Hopefully, an end to agitation for unification with Serbia, thereby lessening the perceived threat of Russian encirclement and pan-Slavism, as hopefully, the southern Slavs would now be content with their new position within the empire. Let's discuss the fundamental, unsolved problems with this proposal. As will become a big theme in this video, the fundamental issue is Hungary. Like I have just explained, both political parties in Hungary were Hungarian nationalists. There is simply no reason for them to just accept the loss of Croatia, which they saw as a core part of historical Hungary. Now some will point to the fact that such a proposal was actually accepted in our timeline. But remember, this was only in the final weeks of World War I when it was becoming very clear to everyone that the empire's very survival was on the line. Even before the war, such a reform had been proposed multiple times by Austria, and each time Hungary had completely shut it down. Austria can jump high or low, but without Hungary's consent, the Illyrian crown is just not happening. There is, however, one small caveat, but it's not great for Austria either. There is a fourth entity within the empire, the Kingdom of Croatia Slavonia. All the way back when Austria Hungary was established, the inclusion of Croatia in the Hungarian Kingdom was under the condition that Croatia got autonomy from Hungary too. Hungary obliged, but in a rather weak way. Croatia did have their own parliament and limited autonomy, but nothing close to what Hungary had compared to Austria. Hungary would continue to dominate the Croatian economy and politics. In fact, Hungary even sought to use this Croatian puppet to pressure Austria, supporting Croatia's claim to Dalmatia, which would strengthen Hungary's position within the empire. In any world where Hungary accepts the creation of Illyria without a huge crisis, it would have to be within this model, with the entirety of the third crown still falling under very significant Hungarian control. This is the fundamental death nail to most simple, just reform timelines concerning Austria-Hungary. Austria is obviously unlikely to just give land to Hungary, and besides, such a model of Croatian independence wouldn't be enough for the Croat, while Hungary itself will simply never accept the full separation of Croatia from their control. So that's the main issue with reforms from Hungary's perspective, nationalism. But the Austrian half of the empire has plenty of troubles too. Like mentioned before, a main issue here is German nationalism. German nationalists had proposed some interesting ideas to reform the empire too. Within these borders, Germans made up about 33% of the population. So what if we just change those borders? For example, the Linz program 
thought up to secure German hegemony over the empire was rather simple. What if we just give Dalmatia to Croatia and give Galicia to Hungary? The Germans now have the majority of the remnants of the empire, allowing them to dominate it. Even further, the program called for further separation from Hungary, whom they saw as holding the empire back, instead pressing for a customs union and ties to Germany. Now you may think, why would nationalists propose something that would weaken the empire to this extent? Because again, to most, the empire was just a collection of properties by an ancient dynasty. For many groups, like several German nationalists, it did not represent their interests. From the perspective of a German nationalist, ever since the defeat against Prussia, the empire has gone downhill. Hungary practically broke free, power in Germany has been lost, and the emperor was himself siding with the minorities to keep his own crown safe, thereby betraying his own people. This fundamental conflict between crown, nation and nationalism made reform in the Austrian half difficult. For example, Austria wouldn't need Hungarian approval to create an independent Galician crown, satisfying the poles of the region and even giving legitimacy to potential expansion into Russia later. Now of course, ignoring the very strong German and Russian disdain towards such a reform, it would also play right into the hands of not just potential German nationalists, but also the Hungarians, whom would now, relatively speaking, have increased their strength against Vienna. All of these considerations are why the emperor didn't federalize the empire, and instead elected to follow a very successful policy of divide and conquer regarding the nationalities of the Austrian half, rather than a policy of separation and segregation. Every attempted reform within the Austro-Hungarian Empire will either get shut down by the Hungarian parliament, the emperor, at least until his death in 1916, or the Austrian parliament. Fact is, reforming such an empire is a delicate balance and requires far more than a reform-minded emperor like Franz Ferdinand to come to power. I'm sorry for the quick intermission, but by far most of you aren't subscribed. Keep up to date with all the latest releases, consider doing so. Thank you. Now that basically concludes part 1 of the video. Let's move on to part 2. Conflicts between nationalities. Let's assume, just for the sake of argument, that Emperor Charles or Archduke Franz Ferdinand manages a great round meeting of all the nationalities. And they, in principle, agree on reforming the empire into a federation along the crown model. Or maybe an internal civil war, which somehow didn't spiral into a world war, ends in a complete Austrian victory, allowing them to reform the empire as they pleased. Surely, reform is now easy and not still filled with fundamental issues. You just take one good look at the nationalities map and you draw some borders here, there and everywhere. And we have achieved peak Austria-Hungary. Obviously, it is not this simple. First, who deserves their own state? Do we unite Croats and Serbs, or do we try to split them up? What about the Bosniaks? Do the Slovenes get their own state? Do they remain with Austria, or do they get added to Illyria? What about the coastline? Do we give the Ukrainians their own crown, or do we unite them with Poland in a Galician crown? If so, what are their borders? And if we unite the southern Slavs, do we unite the western Slavs too? What about the Sudetenland? What about Banat, a whole mess of ethnicities? What about ethnic enclaves, like the Hungarians surrounded in Transylvania? Now you might have an answer to all of these questions, which you think is completely fair. But the point is, sides need to be chosen in each and every one of these questions. And a bunch more that I haven't mentioned. In each of these disputes, there will be a side unhappy, causing tensions within the new federation. Does it sound like a recipe for success when, however way you draw the borders, there is incredible tension between each of the crowds? Beyond that, I doubt it would even solve the fundamental issue it tries to, nationalism. In fact, it might just make it worse. Just look at Hungary. They finally pretty much accomplished their goal 
gaining independence from Austria in most ways. And what is the first thing that they start doing? Oppressing their own minorities and cementing their dominance over the territory now assigned to them, with the Hungarians themselves going as far or still advocating for further separation from Austria. What exactly is stopping the other nationalities from doing the same? Take a hypothetical Illyrian state as an example. In our timeline, the Croats and Serbs of the Empire put aside their differences to fight together for a better position within the Empire. The liberal minds between the Third Crown concept even wanted special autonomy and rights for the Muslims and Italians in the territory. How progressive! But the same had been the case for Hungary's independence fighters. In practice, the Illyrian state would be about 60% Croatian and about 65% Catholic. Now, it is not a guarantee, but what exactly is stopping the Croatian-Serbian majority from stamping on minority rights anyways? What is stopping the Catholic Croats from dominating Illyria in the same way the Hungarians dominated their crowd, causing entirely new ethnic and religious conflicts. A similar problem surrounds a hypothetical Galician crowd. One thing that united many in Austria was Catholic nationalism. This was a particular driving force behind creating more crowns for some, as it would remove the Orthodox Serbs and Ruthenians from the Empire. I can almost guarantee you that a hypothetical Galician crown would be dominated by the Catholic Poles who would rule over the Romanians and Ukrainians in their crown. And again, that is not even discussing German and Russian opposition to this Polish crown being created. And losing Germany, Austria-Hungary's only ally, is obviously also a recipe for disaster. Now we don't need to go through every example, but the point should be clear. Just adding more crowns, even if you go really crazy with it, does not solve the issues of nationalism and oppression. It moves them around. But those are the internal issues. There is also the fact that there is absolutely no reason to believe that now, somehow, all the states will be happy and united forever, as there are still the issues of external powers to consider. We have talked of Hungarian desires for independence and German desires for integration with Germany. Why exactly would we believe that the Illyrians stop seeking Southern Slavic unification? In the best case, we might see Illyrians warmongering a potential invasion of Serbia and Montenegro. In a worst case, like with Hungary, independence parties would still exist and could still seek unification with Serbia. A similar pattern might be seen in Galicia, which might also seek a conquest against Russia while complicating relations with Germany, considering the Poles living in that nation too. The Emperor has to justify to the Germans that he has no intention of uniting the Poles, which could only further rile up the Poles within Galicia. Of course, any Transylvanian crown would also have the exact same considerations regarding Romania. So either the crown steer the empire towards a very belligerent course, especially against Russia and allies, or much like how the ethnic Hungarians attempted to use their autonomy to gain further independence, so too could the crowns use their autonomy to steer towards independence and unification. This, then, ties in significantly to my final point for the day. The very significant weakening of the central government due to the creation of these crowns. Let's first discuss a semi-realistic route to reform. Hungary is somehow convinced to let go of Croatia, but nothing more, and a Galician crown is created. By now, the German-dominated remnants of the Austrian portion of the empire only account for about 36% of the population of the empire as a whole, with 34% in Hungary. This moves a lot of the power to the crowns, as Hungary, in combination with either of the others, has the power to demand further concessions from Vienna. If Austria ever is forced to accept the loss of Czechia or Slovenia too, then they're practically signing away their dominance fully, meaning complete autonomy within a crown for the Czechs is basically impossible. Again, 
The crowns are operating nearly fully independently, and the only thing keeping there together is a loose connection to the emperor. A connection that might initially be strong, but would decline over time. At the same time, we would see serious imperial bloat. Each crown, their own administration, their own passports, their own border policy, and their separate industrial and economic policies. Beyond that, all crowns will demand equal representation in each imperial ministry. Of course, this was already a huge issue in our timeline, where the officers all spoke German and the soldiers just had to deal with it. This was, frankly, a terrible system. The officers couldn't explain themselves to their own soldiers, requiring translators at several levels, if they were even there. This issue might be solved, but it would translate into a new issue, as the crowns could unite to demand their language rights be respected in the military. Rather than at least a lingua franca within the officers of the empire, every order now needs to be translated into at least three languages. To make this bloated system more efficient, the army itself will likely segregate, with each crown having their own divisions and officers to alleviate this language issue. While such a change could make the army a lot more efficient, it would also be a reform which greatly weakens Vienna's control over the army in favor of the crowns. Something which could quickly become an issue in, say, a civil war amongst this empire. This could further be complicated if, say, Czechs and Slovaks are commanded by Poles for convenience, potentially further weakening Vienna's hegemony over the imperial military while opening up conversations about unifying the Western Slavs within the Galician crown. Now don't get me wrong, these aren't necessarily issues impossible to overcome, but the point is, they are significant complications to consider, as the entire fundament of the empire has to change in a way that weakens the central government, removing its ability to keep the empire together by force and threats if necessary. It is a very real question to ask, how much autonomy can you delegate in this way before dissolving the empire is only a formality? How much can the empire reform in this way before its internal and external weaknesses become an existential threat to its own existence? So, in conclusion, I don't think the reformation of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in terms of the model of crowns is a long-term positive solution for the empire's survival, without even mentioning the immense hurdles that need to be overcome to even establish it. Again, this is not because I am against multicultural societies, it is because underpinning the differences and giving special rights to some of the minorities is not a solution to it. For the Austro-Hungarian Empire to successfully reform, it would need some strong, unifying identity. And besides this, it can absolutely have federal aspects and autonomy for the minorities, but this shouldn't be as extreme as Hungary getting their near full independence. For this reason, I mostly consider the long-term death of Austro-Hungarian reform to lay in the Austro-Hungarian Compromise. From that point onwards, there was an end goal for autonomy within the empire, which all nationalities could eventually seek to achieve. A reformed Austrian empire was absolutely a possibility, but just one more crown is just not a viable way to have the Austro-Hungarian empire survive in the long term. Now before we go, remember to check out My Heritage to discover all about your own past and create your very own family tree. For now, I will thank you all for watching. Consider leaving a like and a comment, as well as subscribing if you've enjoyed this video. Pick the video on top to watch another in this series. If you've already seen it, then I'm sure that the bottom video is great too. Once again, thank you all for watching, and goodbye.